2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 20. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we shall do. Verse 21, And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. Rather than fight his son, David's son rose up against him, stole the hearts of the people, and, and rather than have a big battle in Jerusalem and avoiding a bloodbath, David just abdicated the throne and left. But when he did, he left 10 concubines to run the house. And of course, Absalom and his men all came into and took over the, the palace. Hithophel was a counselor to David and now had switched to being a counselor for Absalom, thinking that Absalom would be the next king. He wanted to stay in good graces with the new king, so he, he switched over. What a terrible thing for people to only be loyal to their own personal interests. That was Ahithophel. And Ahithophel tells Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. This was his advice. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house. Not only this, they're going to make it all visible. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house. And Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. This is how crazy it gets when you remove the man of God. Brother and Sister Holton, I want to say how thankful that I am that y'all have moved back here. We love you guys so much. If you don't know Brother and Sister Holton, they are a retired pastor from Indiana. They were with us, and then they moved over to the left coast of Florida. But they are now back in their right mind. So glad y'all are here. Love you guys. But when you remove the man of God, you remove the church out of this world, chaos breaks out. And the counsel of Ahithophel, now this is the verse, I've never seen this, and this is where I want to pull my subject matter from tonight. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. He didn't hear from God, but it was like he did. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. It was almost as if he heard from God. My subject tonight is simply blind spots. Blind spots. Would you bow your heads and pray? Lord, we're thankful to be in your house. Thankful for your anointing. Thankful for your spirit. Thankful for your people. What a great God you are, Lord. What a privilege it is to worship you. Declare your glory and your greatness. Thank you for your word that instructs us and guides us through the fog that's called life. And it gives us, Lord, clear waters to sail in, clear skies to fly in. It illuminates our path. It directs our step. What a great God. Thank you for your word. Now allow it to penetrate our heart and spirit and change us, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. From the, the very beginning of Israel's desire to have a king, there was trouble. There, there was trouble in kings not following godly counsel. Perhaps they felt like they were above that. And Samuel had been the prophet, and he was a godly man. But he was the victim of a people that wanted to be like everybody else. Be careful about wanting to be like everybody else. And Israel wanted to be like everybody else. But Israel was not supposed to be like everybody else. 
They were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're a call out people. But they wanted a king and they tried to persuade Israel that, you know, kings are going to take your sons and go into battle and there's going to be taxation and all that goes with having a, having a king. And yet they wanted a king still. It wasn't the plan of God. God wanted there to be a spiritual leader, which he had through Samuel and prophets. But God allowed them to have what they wanted. Many times the Lord will do that. It does not mean that it's God's will. It means that it's your will. And he allows you to have what you desire. Knowing what will go with it. But because of his love, he allows us to have what we think we deserve. So Saul was picked. Saul was picked as the first king and first and second Samuel tells this incredible story of, of Saul and David and Solomon and then uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam and when the wheels really started to fall off. But it started with King Saul. And when Saul was picked, he appeared to be a humble man. When he was chosen, he, the Bible said, was, was hidden amongst the stuff. Like when they were having their coronation ceremony, he was like, Where, where's Saul? We're doing this for him. He's, he's hidden somewhere. And they had to go and find him and bring him out. And it appeared that, that he was um, a humble man. But early on, you begin to see the cracks in his character. There were blind spots. He was an insecure leader. And what appeared to be humility at the beginning, it became clear later on it was actually insecurity. Be careful about what appears to be humility. Someone said one time, and I, I guess there's some thought to this. I'm, I'm not sure how to dissect all of this. I'm not a psychologist. Maybe my mom can work on this. It'll be her homework between now and Wednesday. And um, there's some thought and there's this statement that's made that, that, that people that, that just say, you know, I would worship, but I'm shy. They say that that is actually pride with lipstick on. Now, I'm not sure how all that works. I, I have heard, I remember hearing um, Barack Obama say when he was running for president, I can't even remember what it was in relation with, but I remember him saying something about a pig wearing lipstick. And it's like those things should not go together. But I think I understand what the metaphor is. I think it's basically that it's pride kind of dressed up to be something much more acceptable. Oh, I'm just shy. No, you're not shy. You're just full of pride. You ought to say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, like everybody else. Oh, it's just not me. I'm just, I'd rather not. No, but you'll get in the ball game and act like an absolute idiot. <laughs> you were designed to worship something. And, and it becomes clear, although it appeared that he was playing the humble role early on, that Actually, he was very uh, insecure. And this insecurity that King Saul had, it caused him to make bad decisions. Decisions that were, that were based in fear rather than faith and moral certainty. Everybody has blind spots, ladies and gentlemen. It can be pride. It can be fear. It can be lust. There's, there's all kinds of blind spots. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say blind spots? You know when you go to change lanes... And you got that side mirror, and you look in your side mirror, you look in your rear view mirror, you got all these mirrors you can look in. But even with all of those mirrors, there's blind spots. There's a certain place like where a, a car in another lane can be that's hidden. And you, you look in your mirror and you can't see them, you look in your rear view mirror, you can't see them, you glance to your left, and you're traveling, you know, 70, 80 miles an hour down Interstate 95, and you have to change lanes. 
And there's those blind spots that can hurt you. Because there is an obstacle. There's another vehicle over there, but you can't see it. It was in your blind spot. And there's a danger with blind spots. Now, I'm thankful they've, they've made cars now. You may be familiar with it. Your car may have it. Where now, there's little lights that flash that say, hey, you got somebody in your blind spot. So now, not only do you have to uh, look in your mirror, you got to also make sure there's no lights flashing. That's right. This is why it's so important for you to have spiritual, godly counsel in your life. Because though you have to make the decision whether or not you're going to heed the counsel, the counsel is like those lights that are flashing that are saying, hey, you can't see it, but there's a danger over here. It's in your blind spot. And it can be a lot of different things. Your blind spot can be a relationship. You may be friends with somebody and you think, man, this is a nice person. This is a great person. But you need a pastor that can tell you that guy is a problem. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but there, there is a family in our church that uh, they have children. I'm trying to stay real general so you don't figure out who it is. And these children will sometimes date others. And when these others come to town, they always schedule an appointment for me to meet this other person that's interested in their children. Did I stay broad enough or did I give away too much? And I commend them for that. Because most people, their kids day, they don't care, blah, blah, blah. They don't come to see the pastor. And I'm not looking for more work. But by the time it gets to me, strong horses pumped full of steroids cannot pull these two people apart. That's right. That's right. Not that you want to pull them apart, but you want to at least be able to counsel. Right. Say, so, you know, what are you doing? What's your plans? Where are you going? Da, 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 da. You got to stay at the beginning of that. You, you can't wait until, well, you know, he seems to be like a nice person. You, seem to be, you don't know nothing about him. They met on the internet. <laughs> now let me just say something about long distance relationships long distance relationships give you a false sense of knowing a person you do not know them because you've been on the phone with them you got to be around them you got to see them in situations you got to see how they react when they lose at monopoly My wife would have seen that. She probably wouldn't have married me. <laughs> you can have, thank you. You can have, you can have blind spots. This is why God gives you a pastor. This is why God gives you spiritual counsel to say, you know what? I, I just see some danger there. You just need to be careful. You need to go slow. When you tell two people that are already thinking that they're in love with each other, which you know as well as I do, they're just involved in the euphoric, you know, atmosphere of the emotional aspect of, of meeting somebody new and so forth, that, you know, you're just kind of raptured up in all of that and you can't think clearly. That's why you got to have godly, you got to decide ahead of time. You know what? It doesn't matter if I'm head over heels crazy about somebody. I don't even know why I'm just talking about dating because this is advice for all of life. But it seems to find its way with dating a lot of times. But you, you have to make up in your mind ahead of time. Not wait till you're in the middle of it. You got to make up your mind ahead of time. There's certain people I'm not going to run with. I'm not going to go to certain parties at work. I'm not going to put myself in certain environments. You got to make up your mind ahead of time. Because if you wait till you're in the middle of a relationship, you can't think clearly then. It, it appears that everything's okay. And so it becomes a blind spot. It can be a relationship. Um, it, it can be a certain uh, weakness in our nature. And let me, let me tell you something. I don't care if you've had the Holy Ghost for 75 years. You still have blind spots. I have blind spots. 
bishop has blind spots. You know why we have blind spots? Because we're human beings. We are wearing flesh. And when you wear flesh, you have got blind spots. That's why everybody needs a pastor. I need a pastor. You need a pastor. We all need spiritual leaders because it's a covering. And let me tell you what you don't need. You don't need somebody on the internet being your pastor that you don't know nothing about. We have, during this COVID season, um, which has lasted much longer than we thought it was, a lot of people started watching stuff uh, online. I can point to at least three families in this church that have lost out with God because they started following people on the internet that they have no idea who they are. The Bible says to know them that labor among you. Just because somebody can give a speech, a hit the fell could give an incredible speech. It was as if he had heard from God. But ladies and gentlemen, he wasn't hearing from God. He was just a smart cookie. He, he, he was a strategist. There are people that can get online and say all kinds of things. And you sit there because you haven't been to church in 12 months. You sit there gullible, blind spot. Why do you think the pastor's up here preaching? We all need to come together. You need to come to church. Pastor must want us all to die. In the middle of COVID, he wants us all to come to church. No, it's a flashing light. It's a blind spot. You can't be saved not going to church. I don't know how else to say it other than to say I love you and I want you to go to heaven and I'm thankful for the internet, but you got to go to church. Now, God loves us enough that he gives people to help us with blind spots. This is what he did with Saul. He gave Saul Samuel to help him with those blind spots, but it was obvious that Saul wasn't heeding the warning lights. And Samuel gave him a lot of warning lights. That little mirror was flashing constantly. But he didn't have any regard for the advice of Samuel. He actually, he didn't have a place for Samuel in his inner circle. In 1 Samuel 13, he waited, King Saul we're talking about, he waited for Samuel for seven days because the prophet was to offer sacrifice before battle. And Samuel was late. So Saul took matters into his own hands. And as soon as he finished, Samuel showed up. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> as soon as you take the car to the mechanic, it'll just purr like a kitty cat. Everything's great. The mechanic said, we can't find anything wrong with you. You get in your car and you drive home. <laughs> it just, I don't know. It's just life, I guess. As soon as you think that you have pulled one over on your parents, they walk in the door. Your sins will find you out. Saul reveals his blind spot here. He blames Samuel for being late. And then he blames the people by saying they were scattered. He was afraid they were going to drift off. You know, we waited and you weren't here. And so I had to do this and that and the people and you were late and when Samuel leaves, Saul then numbers the people. Now that gesture right there makes it clear that he is going to trust in strength rather than God. That? We know how to kill a bullock. He then puts the people on a fast at the conclusion of the battle. He's trying now to be his own spiritual advisor. Blind spot! I don't need a church. I don't need a pastor. I got a Bible. I got a computer. I got a Bible program with a cross-reference in it. Blind spot! Trying to be his own spiritual advisor. Trying to be his own pastor. The next time that Saul takes matters into his own hands and, Saul confronts, or Samuel confronts him on it, Saul blames the people again. And then he makes the statement that reveals his blind spot. He says he did not obey because he feared the people. Now, he is showing you what's directing his decision-making process. He makes more excuses, but they're based in fear. Samuel, as his spiritual leader, calls it what it is. He calls it rebellion and stubbornness. Now, let me just stop and say this again, because I want you to understand why we're working through this story. You need someone in your life that will call it what it is. 
I said, you need somebody in your life who will call it what it is. This is why it's so important to have a godly spouse. Because a godly spouse will tell you, you need to pray, you got a bad attitude. Thank God for that. You don't want people that just pat you on the back while you run yourself to, down to the path to hell. Oh, you're doing awesome, you're doing awesome. They're just clearing the path for you and you just run it, run it, run it right over the cliff. That's what people think they want nowadays. Nowadays in these mega churches, they just want somebody up there who's been working out and wearing a muscle shirt to stand up there and, 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 and be their preacher with tattoos all over their body. And they're going to stand up there and, and do all of these little fancy speeches. Uh, they don't even know who you are. They got 15,000 people in the church. Uh, and guess what? I've been to those churches. You know what happens? The kids are in church. They're just babysitting the adults while the kids are in Sunday school. Well, y'all got quiet there. Let me, I may have to explain that one. It's like they're just going to a performance. There's no spiritual covering. They don't want to say anything offensive. So everything becomes a Norman Vincent Peale speech. You know, the guy that wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. It becomes like uh, one of these uh, Joel Osteen things. I'm not supposed to be naming other people's names. So forget. You may want to shut the video off. This is in-house. <laughs> you're such a good boy. You're such a... No, you need somebody that'll say no. You are messing up. You need some help. You need to get to the altar. I wouldn't give you two cents for a pastor that won't tell you what thus saith the Lord. There's a lot of people where it appears that they heard from God, but it's not from God if it's not biblical principle. You got to have somebody that'll say, no, that's not right. That's sin. You need to repent. You need to get on your face. You need to call out to God. Why? Because above all else, we must be saved. First Samuel is just littered with all these mistakes that Saul makes. But it's because he does not realize or acknowledge his weaknesses. The Lord says, just, you know, enough is enough. He tells Samuel, go anoint a new king. He just, even God reaches a point where he's just like, I'm done. And, and he did this. Now watch this. This is an important little point to know. He does this while Saul is still king. Just because Saul is still in the position doesn't mean that he's in the favor of God. Samuel chapter 15 ends with the Lord repenting that he made Saul king. He literally repents that he picked Saul. God repents that he picked Saul. Oh, my friend, everybody needs spiritual covering. And when you don't have spiritual covering, you're exposed. And you may think that you're okay because the hand of God has not been removed. You may still look the part. You may still go through the motions. But when your protection is removed, you're exposed. Before long, Saul starts to lose his mind. He's paranoid. He's bipolar. He's eaten up with anger and jealousy. He's consumed with chasing David. He turns on his own son. Chapter 18 says that Saul is afraid of David because he knows that the Lord is with him. David was just walking with God. David was trying to serve the king. David's over there trying to play a harp. Oh, now here's another message. There was an evil spirit that would come upon Saul. You know why? Because he was exposed. He had rejected Samuel as his spiritual leader. He had taken everything on himself. And so now he's got an evil spirit that comes upon him. And they bring David. There's something about people that have a walk with God. Other people can tell. Would you come and sing? 
Would you come and be around? And they wanted David to come into the kingdom and to play his harp. And while he's playing his harp, there's some things you can't make them go away with good music. You, you, you can't put a Band-Aid on cancer. You can't just play sweet songs and think that it's somehow going to heal. The pain and the misery of living a life of rebellion. And so literally, Saul gets more angry as he's sitting there with his javelin in his hand. And this boy's playing a harp. And it's supposed to be music to make the evil spirits go away. But it don't work that way. The only thing that makes that go away is to fall on your knees and repent. And take ownership of your sin. That's the only thing that will make you... You can't listen to enough gospel music to somehow cause you to move into an atmosphere of, of having that presence of God around you. And it, it, God doesn't work like that. The Lord comes where there is a place that is prepared for him. And when you look at how the place was prepared for the Lord's presence to come, it was always with a sacrifice. We want the blessing of God without the sacrifice. The sacrifice is repentance. The sacrifice is submission. The sacrifice is obedience. This is what Samuel was trying to tell Saul. But Saul wouldn't listen. And so while David's playing the harp, trying to create a, 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 a spiritual atmosphere... He's, he's trying to nail him to the wall with a javelin because it reminds him of where he used to be. And when you look at the life of Saul and you see where in the world did he get so far off track, this is where it all goes back to. It all goes back to who in his life is he listening to? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what it all goes back to. 1 Samuel 20, 24. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat meat. They had these different harvests, these different feast times. And so King Saul sits down, and verse 25 describes who's at his table. And the king sat upon his seat as at other times, even upon the seat by the wall. They're talking now about the placement of the people around him as he seat. This is his inner circle. And Jonathan arose, that's his son, and Abner, he was the captain of his guard, sat by Paul's side, and David's place was empty because David was fearful for his life, so he's hiding in the field. This is, this is who Saul had around his table. Do you notice who there was not a seat prepared for? Samuel. There was no place for Samuel in Saul's life. That's why Saul got so far off track. Near the end of his life, Saul is going to witches, trying to dredge up the dead spirit of Samuel. While Samuel is alive, he doesn't value his counsel. After he dies, he decides he should have listened. So he literally goes to a witch and indoor. And tries to dredge up the dead spirit of Samuel. What about when he was alive, Saul? God gave you a covering to help you with your blind spots. I thank the Lord for Bishop Myers. And I thank the Lord for Dr. Myers. And we did the right thing honoring them last week. Because they've been a spiritual covering for 50 years. There ought to be a place for a bishop in your life. There ought to be a place for a pastor in your life. There ought to be a place at your table for spiritual leadership because they help us with the blind spots. Now, David becomes king, and he has a close relationship with God, but he's human, so he has blind spots. Joab, his general, has blind spots, though he's a tremendous warrior. Uh, he, he had an anger issue. And he was not submitted to David. Uh, it, it may be because he knew the skeletons in David's closet, so he couldn't respect him. I'm not sure. But here's what I do know from the word. He mistook David's compassion as weakness and literally took it upon himself 
to rebuke David as king when he wept over Abner and Absalom. David wept over both of those men, and both of those men died at the hands of Joab. And David, because of the heart that he had, he wept over him, and Joab rebuked him when he wept over Absalom. Joab had blind spots, but he wasn't submitted to David, so he never um, was able to get help with that. And eventually he, he dies at the hands of Solomon. David has his own blind spots. And David falls into sin while he's bored at home with his men on the battlefield. And he sends Joab a message to, to send Bathsheba's husband, the lady he's had an affair with, to the front line so that he will die in battle. And that's what happens. Uh, David is, is a person who has blind spots, but he has a relationship with God. But even then, he's dealing with flesh and he's exposed because he has his own issues. Joab has his issues. Joab is not submitted. And David makes a terrible mistake and then compounds it with another mistake to cover his first mistake. And that's how sin works. It's kind of a runaway train. But the difference with David and Saul and Joab and even his sons, the difference with David is that David listens when he's confronted by the prophet Nathan. And Nathan comes in and says to David, Thou art the man. You are the one. And we, we read this this morning in the message, Psalms 51. David takes ownership of it. He doesn't blame the people. He doesn't blame Joab. He doesn't blame, blame his court. He doesn't blame his men. He doesn't blame any. He's the king. He's used to being catered to. But he takes ownership of it. He prays this amazing prayer in Psalms 51. And the Lord forgives him and restores him. Though David's sin is not without consequence. His family has multiple issues after this. Sin always has consequences. Even though God may forgive you, sin still has consequences. And, but the difference is that David is able to find his way back into the heart of God because he falls on his face and he says, I have sinned against thee, the only, O God. Oh, East Wind, can I preach to you my heart tonight? I pray that if we, you are revealed that there are blind spots in all of our lives, that you would react to it in such a way that you say, I take ownership of it. I want to be saved. I want my family to be saved. Whatever it takes, I am willing to do it. David finds his way back into the heart of God because he listens he heeds those flashing lights in his side mirror telling him about a blind spot. You say, how could that be a blind spot, David? You had an affair with somebody that wasn't your wife and then you killed her husband. How is that a blind spot? It would surprise you the way that people can justify their actions. It would blow your mind. That people can do terrible things and spiritualize it. Absalom, uh, David's son, he kills his half-brother Amnon. The reason he killed Amnon is because Amnon raped his sister Tamar. Absalom goes into exile when he comes back. Gets his dad to forgive him, who's David, King David. He starts to work to steal the hearts of the people. Works for 40 years doing it. He eventually makes a run for the throne. As we mentioned in the text, David leaves so they don't have this big bloodbath. When he leaves, one of David's top advisors, Ahithophel, decides to stay and advise Absalom. He figures he's going to be on the winning side. But here's what's interesting about the way this scenario starts to play out. Another of David's advisors that is loyal to David decides to stay and to try to frustrate the counsel of Ahithophel. So he's literally 
loyal to David, but he stays to advise Absalom and his men as a spy to frustrate the purpose of Ahithophel. That brings us to the text. This little verse that David and Absalom had regarded the counsel of Ahithophel as one who had heard from God because he was, he was such a great strategist. But it wasn't from God. Ladies and gentlemen, not everything that appears to be from God is from God. In fact, a lot of times it's not. You would be surprised how many times we hear people say, you know, I, I just was praying about this and I just felt like the Lord instructed me to do this and that. And I'm like, no, I, I don't say it out loud. <laughs> Maybe I should. I, I need to start doing it. I'm, I'm tired of the devil stealing people. Their lives ending up a wreck. But in my heart, I say, that wasn't God, that was you. You really want to do that. And, and, and maybe it'll turn out okay, but there's a strong possibility it won't. So just be patient. Sometimes time can reveal all things. When you're such in a hurry that you cannot heed spiritual counsel, that ought to be a warning light that you are out of the will of God. And so Ahithophel advised, the advice is frustrated by David's spy. And God gets involved in this and he causes Absalom and his men to follow the counsel of the man that's loyal to David rather than Ahithophel. And Ahithophel advises Absalom and his men, you need to go and chase them down right now while they're at the fjord before they go over the Jordan River. They're wounded, they're hurt, they're disoriented. Attack now, take 12,000 men, go and take your elite and, and take them over. Don't kill any of the other men. Just go directly for David. Once you kill David, this thing will be over. You'll be the king. It'll be done with. That's what Ahithophel says. And then they bring in the other guy, and they say, what do you think? And they said, no, right now they're like a mother bear who's been robbed of their cubs, and they're fierce warriors, and everybody knows it. Wait until you can gather all the people together, and then go, and then attack them once you've organized everybody, and... And they've had a chance to settle down and they're in the wilderness and then you'll be the king. And so the Lord, the Bible says, even got involved in causing Absalom and his men to listen to this other counsel. The Bible says that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I fear for people that have got in a season of distrust. I know that we live in a very strange time. We don't know who to believe. We don't know whether to believe Fauci. We don't know whether to believe John Hopkins University, Mayo Clinic, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated, COVID, Delta variant, do this, do that, don't do this, do this, do that. There's so many different things. People don't know what in the world to do. We don't know who to trust. And if we're not careful, it'll bleed over into not sure if we should trust the word of God. Not sure if we should trust the man of God. Oh, my friend, God has never failed us one time. I've come to tell you, you can trust God. You can trust that book. He's not going to lead you astray. It is forever settled in heaven. For 2,000 years, it's been guiding humanity. Don't let the distrust of this season bleed over. And don't let smooth-talking, charismatic personalities pull you out of your church. And you don't think you need church anymore because you got your own minister online. You don't know who those people are. And if you're not careful, you'll start to think something is from God and it's not from God. And I could give you more detail about this, but I'm trying not to offend. This is me trying not to offend, believe it or not. You remember me telling you about Amnon, David's uh, son who um, 
committed this horrific crime against his half-sister. There's a little verse that tells you what led to this horrific crime. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 2. And it says, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. He was so lustful. He wanted his half-sister Tamar. Tamar was very beautiful. He wanted her so bad that he got sick. What a loser. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. And then verse 3, these famous five words, but Amnon had a friend. whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, a cousin. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Jonadab gives him a plan. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be careful who your friends are. Who is sitting at your table? Who are you talking with when your guard is down? Who are you letting speak into your life? In the 58 years that I have been on this planet and I have watched people come in and out of church all my life, being a preacher's kid, being on staff, and now being senior pastor for 23 years, I can tell you that the number one blind spot is friends. The wrong friends. If you've got the wrong voices in your life, this is why you got to be so careful who you hang with, especially as a young person. When we're so influenced by our friends, everybody's influenced by their friends, but at that age, you're really influenced by your friends. And if you've got the wrong voices in your life, you will have a collision. That's why you got to stay close to God. That's why you got to stay under the covering of spiritual leadership. you got to realize that everybody has got a blind spot. Uh, but God has given you a pastor. God has given you a bishop. God has given you warning lights. That's trouble. He's trouble. She's trouble. you got to heed the warning. Because above all else... We must be saved. Would you stand to your feet? Now, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but we have a baby dedication. <laughs> and I said, Lord, blind spots? Baby dedication? And the Lord just let me know. Nobody has more blind spots than a baby. How many things do we have to protect them from? Don't touch this. Don't grab that. Don't crawl over there. This can hurt you. That can hurt you. When we dedicate a baby, which we're getting ready to dedicate little Jade and Alexander, John and Katie want to come up with him. He's only two weeks old. It's his very first church service. Don and Bev, y'all can come up too if you want to. Bring Lexi with you. I was talking with John and Katie before service. And I was just thinking about these verses. And we were talking about how that all of us as parents, that we have a responsibility to raise our children in the fear of God. To protect them from all the blind spots. I know eventually people make their own decisions, but for a number of years, God expects us to be on the wall, protecting our homes. Oh, my friend, don't let a bunch of garbage come in through entertainment into your home. You say, oh, it's a Disney movie, but there's a philosophy behind it. They want to steal the minds of our young people. 
And we were, we were talking before service, and I said, you know, and I know you guys already know this, but I just think it bears repeating. You have to be intentional about raising your children on the principles of God's Word. You can't expect for them to just get it by osmosis. You, you have to be intentional about it. This is the verses that came to my mind when we were talking, because this is what the Lord told the the children of Israel. I'm reading from Deuteronomy 6. He said, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son multiple generations all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged hear therefore O Israel and observe to do it that it may be well with thee and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul heart and, and here we go and thou shalt teach them diligently diligently over and over and over I, I was watching um, I was watching the other day an interview that John Wolfram you remember John Wolfram the, the Navy SEAL guy that was a part of the he was the first swimmer, you know, in the water that rescued the Apollo 11 mission. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and all them guys. And it was him and the other three frogmen, and they were all doing an interview together. They're all still alive. And they were doing an interview with him because they, they were just celebrating 50 years of that, of that, uh, that mission. And, um, and those guys started talking about their training. And they said, they were asking them questions like, you know, were you afraid? Did you think about this? The sharks, the da-da-da. And they said, this was the NASA way. We trained over and over and over. We trained three times a day and at night. Four times a day. Every day. Over and over and over. And they said, the reason that we did that and the reason that NASA had us trained that way is because when we got in the water under the pressure everything else was blocked out because we had done it so many times it was automatic for us you know when the Lord tells them here to do it diligently we ought to let our children know so often what the Bible says that it blocks out all the other voices it's our default position. It's who we are. We are the children of God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He said, teach them diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and it shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. He's saying, be diligently, put it everywhere they walk. Teach them, let them know. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't teach your child enough about the Bible. You say, oh, well, we want to have balance in our life. No, balance is a blind spot. That's a key, that's a little euphemism word that's used to minimize the importance of the Word of God in their life. We don't need balance. We need saturation. Mm-hmm.